Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. I shed light on things that are not always talked about with conversations about expanding love. The Elizabeth Cunningham Show starts now. All right, welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding in love. And today we are talking about coloring outside the lines in relationships. Weird, we never talk about anything ever like that. This is such a weird episode. <laughs> but before we get into that and introduce our absolutely fantastic guest. A uh, reminder that the Elizabeth Cunningham Show is live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page, and then is aired on YouTube and podcast format every Thursday. All links are in the show notes, or you can just go to your favorite podcast platform and just search the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, and I will appear. So on today's episode, we will be talking with Dr. Jolie Hamilton about coloring outside the lines in relationships. Dr. Jolie Hamilton is the relationship coach for couples who color outside the lines. She is a research psychologist, TEDx speaker, best-selling author, and ASECT certified sex educator. Julie also co-hosts the Project Relationship Podcast, check that out, with her anchor partner, Ken. Julie's been featured in the New York Times, Vogue, NPR, and The Atlantic. She spent the past two decades studying and reimagining what love can be if we open our imaginations to possibility. Jolie helps people create non-monogamous partnerships that are custom built for their authentic selves. No more shrinking, pretending, or hiding required. Dr. Jolie Hamilton, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I seriously, I feel like we were just meant to meet at some point. I love talking to people who talk about this stuff. Oh my gosh. And you do. I love the way you talk about it. So I'm so psyched for this conversation. Oh my God. Well, thank you. No. Oh my gosh. If I could just, ha I mean, that's why I'm on social media, right? Is because I'm like, I just want to talk about this all the time. <laughs> and so whoever wants to give me a platform to talk, and then we create our own platforms too, but on that later, but I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. And I do, I love your work. We do, we do very, very similar things, but yeah. I love the way that you talk about polyamory and non-monogamy and you're very um, practical and approachable, but you're also like, you push people, you push people to be like, yeah, what about this? What if you think about it this way? And I love that approach that you have because you, you do, you do need both. You need the approachability and you also need the, I'm going to make you a little uncomfortable now. Like <laughs> that's it. A little uncomfortable. If you're not a yeah. little uncomfortable, it's, I think it was David Bowie who told us like, if you're not a little uncomfortable, that's not your, that's not your work. Just that's not your work. And I just listen to whatever David Bowie says. I just, <laughs> so let's get uncomfortable. <laughs> Life go Yeah, you know, listen to David. I, I have no problem with that philosophy. Listen to whatever David Bowie says. I, mine is Paul McCartney because um, I love the Beatles. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. All you need there is love then and you're good. You're good. I know. I know. I feel like really successful already. I'm like, yeah, Paul McCartney says all you need is love. So everything else that I'm doing is just for fun. So this is right. Great. Right. Love yeah. <laughs> okay. But 
being serious. So what we're talking about today, <laughs> we need we need to be serious to talk about these Seeing topics. This. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to be talking about coloring outside the lines of our relationships. So, you know, obviously I believe that our listeners have a general idea of what we're going to talk about because, you know, non-monogamy and polyamory. Um, but I like what you specialize in specifically is the transition from yeah. monogamy to polyamory and correct me if I'm wrong but you majority majority of the time you work with um couples yes and yeah. this is one of the things that sort of sets me um in a, a slightly different category than a lot of folks who are working in non-monogamy circles because once you start deconstructing love you start to realize ooh, we are very couple centric so yeah. I am I am here for everybody who's out there doing that work and like deconstructing it and saying, wait, we can have relationships with ourselves and with lots of people and we don't have to focus on the couple. Right. However, <laughs> in my in my world, what I found is a lot of people then hide the the way that they really feel about their current couplehood um, when they enter into some non-monogamy circles. They feel a bit of shame around still having a monogamous paradigm or they're not sure how to talk about it or they don't feel like they can admit to the level of couplehood they still have. And all that does is get more people hurt. And yeah. I really believe that by serving couples who want to transition to something more, that is a safer and a more, um, like a, a really a more communally minded approach. So for the folks who want, they've built a life that they love. They want to maintain a relationship to this partner who they've had. Often people I'm working with, they've had 10, 20, even 30 years of solid monogamous partnership. Now they want to open. Mm -hmm. To ask them to just flick a switch and change paradigms isn't realistic. I, I know that because it wasn't how I couldn't do it. And I wanted to desperately, but I couldn't just do it overnight. Um, so I, yeah, I work with couples who want to have something more and that something more really has to be custom built. It has to be custom designed because we're all figuring out what our relationships will be. So what your polyamory is and what mine is, well, unless I ask you, I won't know. So I love helping those couples figure out that in fact, it really is a choose your own adventure. And the trick is to figure out how to talk about it with everyone you're going to relate to. And I know you and I are on the same page here, because if you can describe yeah. it, now you can be consensual. Now you can be honest. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I see and one of the reasons why I love what you do is because um, we, uh, what I see happen is that couples start to enter into this world and mainly people are you know you research and a lot of the time you find like online forums yep. and then people in online forums who've had you know not the same path as you or have very strong opinions about certain things like eat couples alive sometimes yes. like the internet can be a treacherous place for couples who are trying to open up their relationship on all sides, like from people in the non-monogamous community and people in the monogamous community. Exactly. Because couples privilege is real and harm yes. happens in that yes. direction too. And so this is a harm reductive technique on my part right. because I was a secondary partner to a married couple. That was my, my entry point. And it was incredibly abusive mm -hmm. because none of us knew what we were doing. They didn't mean yeah. to be that way. But because of that, I learned the hard way that Every time you shut down a conversation because it's, you know, it's not right, great big air quotes around it. It's not using the right language or they haven't upgraded their operating system fast enough. Right. You actually miss the opportunity to help people get to a place where they can imagine what love could be. Um, but it does take a certain amount of patience to sit with deconstructing those paradigms and a certain amount of tolerance for the fact that people aren't all going to wind up in the same spot. Not everybody wants relationship anarchy, even though I really, I love it and I respect it. I recognize that not everybody's going there. Right. So I love helping people figure out amongst the vast world that there is what the right fit is for them and doing it in a container where they can feel a little safer and a little, it's a little less anonymous, but a little safer than in one of those general relationship forums where frequently yeah you, I mean you misstep a little bit and all of a sudden you're like whoa I am attacked I thought this was going to be a happy place where we talked about love 
or right even worse somebody just shuts down and like one one partner or another is like i can't i can't do it now we bail all together because right. because somebody was mean online right no we can do this better <laughs> yeah i mean i've had people come to me and have like you know the comments that they've gotten is like you're ruining the polyamorous community or you're ruining the non-monogamous community or you should just quit now you know things yeah. like that but aside from just please people be nice to each other and be empathetic to where your people are starting. Um, and what do you see? Like when, when people come to you kind of in general, I know that everyone has their own, you know, starting point, but kind of in general, what do you see as far as like the starting point for couples opening up their relationships? Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is my favorite spot because if someone is, well, let's say non-monogamy is akin to skydiving. I'm a parachute salesman and I like to sell parachutes to people while they are looking at a range of planes and considering what they might do and who they might interact with and what, what moves they might make. And most importantly, what parachutes they want in place when they do so. So I like to talk to people when they're in those very early intro stages, considering what they might do. Whereas say therapists are often working with people who've already jumped out of a plane and are plummeting to the ground with <laughs> no parachutes and no right. relationship agreements in place. So right. I just think of people who are, um, they're in that consideration stage, which may have lasted years. They have, may ha have been talking about that for years and years and years and still nothing's really happened. So there's like two types of couples that I see very frequently. One, they've jumped off the deep end whoo, and they're plummeting or two, they're still talking. And often that's like four or five years. That's the average I see as people have ta been talking about this for four or five years, wow. but no action's been taking. And now it just starts to feel like, is this even a thing? And now they start d doubting their identity and it, it can really devolve. Or they think, no, I'm just gonna have to, we're gonna have to split. We can't have what we want. Everybody was right. This never works. We're playing with fire. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel like in both situations, there is kind of like the, is this even a good idea? Cause like on the one hand, it's like, you've been waiting so long and now, and now you do have like that doubt, right? And right. It's like, can I even do this? And are we even equipped for this and all this stuff? But then on the other hand, which I'm always on the other hand, by the way, I am the wrecking ball person. <laughs> somebody's got to do it. <laughs> somebody's got to do it. And it is usually me. Um, but on that end, it's like, oh crap. Like I've gotten myself or ourselves so deep into something. Like yeah. how do we even get out? Like we have ruined everything, I think. Right. And then <laughs> what does it look like to build something new when you've already broken what there was, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Breaking something that wasn't working isn't necessarily a bad thing, but right. how do you build something? And, you know, I'm in the middle of a home renovation project, a huge one. And there was this stage where they ripped my roof right off my house. Yeah. Once you've ripped the roof off, um, you got to do something. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> when That's you, a great analogy. I love that. <laughs> you don't have another option um, because now everything's going to get destroyed right down to the foundations. And I often work with people who they've built lives they love, which means they either have kids together, pets together, a house together, a business together. A lot of them have businesses together. So there's a lot to lose. And I know this because that's where I was when I started. And that's where most of my clients are. They have something they love. So as soon as they've ripped the roof off, they need really practical skills. And that is my wheelhouse. I, I have been making it my business to codify and make clear the actual skills and processes that will help people make these transitions in smoother ways. And without just going round and round for the next like three years while we think about all the things that could possibly go wrong because you're never going to figure them all out. You do in fact have to get out there and experiment and then debrief. So that's what I do. I provide a space for that to happen. Beautiful. And before, and I do want to get into like some of the, the things that you teach people. Um, but before we go there, I want to go into, um, first of all, why, like, why do people, you said that people are together for like 20 years, 30 years in monogamous relationships, why do people choose to open up their relationship after that long? Yeah. A lot of times the, the answer I get sounds like this. We, 
we love each other and that's great. But I mean, this isn't it, right? <laughs> like this isn't it. Cause now they're looking at another 20, 30, 40 years together. And now they're like, Oh, that's a long time. And they've achieved an amount of stability. So they feel safe. They actually feel the safety that they didn't feel when they were in the dating world all the time, the first time trying to lock somebody down as it were, right? And they did that. So now they're ready to really sort of do something that they didn't feel they were equipped to, or they were ready to go on an adventure together. Specifically, they're like, we're stable. We want to go on this or we want more and we want it together. We don't want to have to say goodbye because we're great in all of these other ways, which doesn't mean everything's perfect, but they have right. some things that they're just like, yeah, this is great. So when those people come to me, they're often, they've had all of these talks or one of them has been talking about in particularly, I just, I don't know. I want more. I just, I just feel like there's something more. Maybe they want to explore their sexuality in a new way, but sometimes it's just about deepening the intimacy that they have with their friendships and really allowing that to be and stopping the constant enmeshment that they never meant to have, but they just practiced because, well, that's just what that's happens just what you do. if you don't, yeah. if you don't intentionally do something else. Mm. Um, yeah, North American relationships are pretty enmeshed. <laughs> They just are. So yeah, yeah, we have to consciously do something else. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the, uh, it's kind of like the default setting. It's yeah. like, this is the default setting. This is what we, it's the idea that we've grown up with. It's the idea that we were taught. It's, you know, what's been working, but yeah. And I, I totally hear that. And that's kind of what I hear people say as well. And especially like the, 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 isn't there more? Yeah, part. that's it. And that's also where I, like, there's that little bit of shame. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. if that something more has anything to do with their sexuality, mm. anything at all. Even if there's just an inkling of it, like, I think the more might be that I want to develop my own sexuality. It's not even about someone else necessarily, but I want to explore this. And I, I feel like I've boxed myself in here. Now, there are lots of ways to explore your sexuality in monogamy. And if monogamy feels great for you, I'm like, awesome, cool. Let's do individuation relationship work. We can do that. You don't have to want polysexual relationships. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. That's fine. But my, in my experience, people who want more, they need to do all the other things. They, they, whether they want to have multiple sexual partners or not, because that's the part that gets all the sexy attention, right? Yeah. Um, and that's the part that leaves people, you know, slapping each other on stages and what have you. But, <laughs> you know, there's a lot to be said for just really treating your partner with full bodily autonomy and for really treating their friendships as entirely their own or for just allowing them to develop at their own pace and rate and we don't practice that. So there are so many pieces to the, the untangling of monogamy that are actually just about untangling from enmeshment to allow you to individuate. So for me, it's all about that. I mean, I trained as a, a Jungian psychologist, so I care about individuation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I think that that's, the, that's definitely the first stage is just looking at the individual. I always say, start with you first. That's like one of yes. my catchphrases, start with you first. Right. Yeah. Of course, because you know, I'm sure you see this. I see it all the time. The one thing I don't recommend is for you to go find someone you're interested in and now try to open your couplehood. That, that's, that's the date. Like, and again, I learned all of my lessons the hard way. <laughs> and I did them all badly first because I had no teachers, no guides. And it was 2009. We didn't have all the books and podcasts and resources we do now. Um, when you already have your sights set on someone, now your partner can feel all of the jealousy. I'm also a jealousy researcher. That's my primary qualitative research is in jealousy. So mm -hmm. all of the welling up jealousy that they feel now has a target that is not ideal. That's not the great place to start working on it from. No. So ideally we'll start with ourselves first. That something more becomes, I want more me. I want mm -hmm. more access to me. And then multiple relationships becomes yeah, just delicious and freeing and exciting. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Okay, so I want to 
switch gears a little, but we're still staying in kind of like the beginning stages here. So, you know, we have like the why and kind of like the, the how is like starting to form, but what are some of the things that people, and, you know, probably jealousy being one of them, but what are some of the things that people run into in this process that are, that are hard, that are like sticky, that are difficult to deal with, or, you know, cause anytime that you're switching these paradigms, like you said, you know, you take the roof off of your house, you have a problem now. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the the problems? problems. (laughs) Yeah. And everyone can see the problem. Exactly. And so what are some of the problems that you see couples really dealing with? Yeah. So I see a few big ones that come up really for everyone. I've never seen these not show up for a couple who's opening up. One is pacing. Somebody usually instigates the whole, the whole scenario, right? Somebody brings it up. And now we have this hot potato of pacing. Like, are we evenly paced? Um, did you start this? Now we pass that back and forth. Did you start it? Did you say yes? Can we can we date at the same pace? Do we get on dating apps at the same pace? Do we, what if one of us has an easier time dating? What if one of us figures out that we're demisexual? We didn't even know the word demisexual, but now we do. And now, oh my God, what do I do? So pacing and the idea of fairness, trying to stay in lockstep with your partner will not work. And it is anti-individuation material. Like that does not help. So that one is a big one. And it takes a lot of coming back to yourself and getting tools, getting tools to soothe your nervous system. I, I do somatic work with people so that they can soothe. And also getting clear about the fact that you're committed to this for a longer arc than your discomfort, right? It can't be just about today's discomfort. So that's why I work with people for at least a year so that we can go through this process because time is necessary. So pacing is one. Um, Another huge one is relationship agreements. You know, everyone should have them, like everyone in every relationship. I have them with my children. I have like relationship agreements help everyone. And I think of them as something you need, you need in stages. I I use a three-tiered system. You need a level one for everyone, level two if you have non-monogamy, promises and agreements. And number three is if you add kink to that, you need these three levels. As you add the levels, we need to get clear about how to do it, not just how to make the agreements, but what the agreement actually is, what it's for. Um, I teach people a process to make the agreement. And then how do I actually use it? Because it's not a weapon. Relationship agreements get weaponized and that's not what they're for. Your relationship agreement is to keep you accountable to you. That's the, that's it. Like that's that's what they're for. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah. And I think that at any, at any, anything that you've mentioned so far, I mean, anything can be weaponized period. Yeah. (laughs) But anything that you've mentioned so far, like you talked about fairness and pacing, you know, there can be a weaponization there, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, you talked about, yeah, you know, agreements, absolutely, where agree, you know, and this is kind of like the, and then that line, and hierarchies, right, and like, that's kind of the line between like agreements and rules, right, like, actually, can you break down agreements versus rules? I would love to hear your, hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think every non-monogamy researcher has their take on this, Um, Mine is this. First off, I like to move things from the implicit expectations and assumptions column Mm -hmm. over to the explicit agreements column. And I separate that from rules. Rules are designed to hold my partner to. This is the rule. An agreement is my agreement of what I will hold myself to in this relationship. So I, I don't care if people want to use the word rules. Like if that works for them, okay. Like your semiotics are yours to have, go for it. But, um, the, the move of rules is often about you agreed to this. You have to do it under all circumstances. I can give a really great example. Um, I broke my wrist once and my partner needed to take me to the emergency room and my meta was so angry, so angry. There was no one else to take me. He needed to take me to the emergency room. But the rule was that he couldn't spend time with me at that time of day. That was toxic 
<laughs> and unhelpful. And that is a good way. A test is, will this actually serve us as, will this serve everyone involved? Because an agreement can serve everyone if it's well held. Right. Not everybody's and able to. Yeah, and it, and it does take that self-awareness and self-regulation of, am, am I holding myself to something or I, am I imposing this on and, someone else? Right, right. And, and it requires, it absolutely requires tons of conversation in order to, to discern this. I don't think agreements are something you should just make like, oh, we'll just sit down, we'll answer a set of questions. No one else can actually ask you a set of questions that will get you there. So my agreement process it takes some time, it takes some unfolding, and then it becomes a living document. It has to become a living document because it cannot stay static and still serve everyone involved. And rules versus agreements, once we've moved into agreements, now we can potentially reinvent our whole relationship structure. We can do things that we couldn't imagine were possible before. Mm -hmm. But then of course you'd ask me what comes up and the third thing is jealousy. It does come up for everyone, though not everybody will, will use the word, but I promise it's present. Even if, if you're not the jealous one, that's okay. That doesn't mean nobody else is jealous of you. <laughs> like there's three points on a jealousy triangle. You're going to be on some, some of those points at some point in your life. What are the three points of the jealousy triangle? So there's me, my beloved, and my, and the perceived interrupter. The perceived interrupter might be a real person, but it might also be your Instagram. It could be, it could be imagined, no problem. But that's Tinder. Exactly. It's Tinder. It, it's always about a person though. It's all, so it could be an, an imagined person, but it's always a person. And that's how you can tell it different from envy. Envy is about, I want what you have. I long to be what you are. So it's about me and you and I, thou thing. And that je jealousy triangle. So yeah, it's no fun to be someone else's perceived interrupter. It's no fun really to be the beloved who's having to navigate all this. None of these right. points is necessarily fun, but jealousy can be really helpful in our growth process. So I don't like to steer away from it. Ooh, okay. Oh, okay. We're going to pause. We're going to, we're going to go on a break, but I love what I'm like, Ooh, that is so perfect to end on. Um, we are going to go on a break, uh, really quickly. And then when we get back, we're going to talk about the, all the house that you've been yes. talking about, like, okay, how, well, great. How do you do that? What do you mean by that? And so that's what we'll be talking about when we come back. So stay tuned, everybody. All right, welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love. And we are just having the best conversation with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And we have been talking about specifically couples opening up their relationship and sometimes after long periods of time of being together. And we've gone over, oh my gosh, we covered so much in the first part of the show. Um, but we've gone over a lot, you know, things that couples run into, um, things that are red flags even. And then we started talking about jealousy. And the last thing that you said was like, I, I'm not gonna say it verbatim, but it was like how jealousy is actually good for your relationship. It's growth material growth material. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's I, talk about that. Yeah. I could deep dive into jealousy all day, but I will be succinct. Let me start by saying this. The, um, the general take on jealousy is often that it is something to evolve past or transform. And the APA says it's a negative emotion. And I, I'm going to die on this hill. No, it's not. Neither is <laughs> anger, neither sadness, right? They're not negative. They are, they may, they may. Jealousy is neutral until you choose how to act on it. You may make it into a negative thing if you choose poorly, <laughs> right. but it is not innately negative. And so the way I learned this was by studying it a lot. I do qualitative research studies on jealousy, both uh, in non-monogamous and monogamous individuals. 
And what has turned up over these studies, um, and I just released some new data um, just two weeks ago, is that when we treat jealousy as something that is talk aboutable, something that can absolutely increase my intimacy with my partner because we've created a safe uh, space safe enough for me to be vulnerable and talk about jealousy. And when we allow jealousy to be talked about in our broader communities, whether those are non-monogamous or monogamous, when we can have places to talk about it, jealousy becomes a way for me to know better who I want, what I want, where my energy is flowing, Jealousy is there to be a teacher. It was hardwired into you. Evolutionary psychologists are very clear about this. They can spot it as early as six months old. It was there to connect you to your primary caregiver, but we need to not act on it as though we're still six months old. So we have to take that hardwiring and then bring it into our mature prefrontal cortex life, right? We, we're grownups. And if we do that and we create a conversation about jealousy, now when I feel the sensations of jealousy in my body, if I can learn to, to be with them, if I can learn to soothe my nervous system and be present to them, they've just presented me with clear indication that I care about this person and I value their connection. I do not want it broken. And so now instead of turning my attention to the perceived interrupter and trying to harm them like Hera in Greek mythology, right? Like always killing everybody who's sleeping with Zeus, even though Zeus is the one doing the killing, doing the, all the sl- fucking around, like totally. So <laughs> if we do that. I love that you use that analogy because it's so, that was like my biggest thing about Greek mythology. I'm like, Hera, what? Pull yourself what? together. Yeah, get it together, girl. Like, look at this man. Oh my God. Okay. Anyway, exactly. yes. Yeah. So I study this from an archetypal perspective. So I actually studied Hera specifically. I studied all of the Greek figures of of jealousy because they teach us how jealousy has been perceived for thousands of years. This is not new. What we're experiencing is not new. It's possibly one of the most innate experiences because take mythology out, take jealousy out of mythology and literature. We got some boring stuff and we have no soap operas and no reality TV at all. So... (laughs) We don't actually want a world without jealousy, or at least that's what Netflix tells me. So yeah, <laughs> if though, totally. <laughs> yeah, if I turn all of my attention to the perceived interrupter, I miss the opportunity to use it for what it's for, which is to remind me to strengthen my connection to my beloved. Now, if that's monogamous, you might handle it in one set of ways. If that's non-monogamous, I might handle it in another. But in all cases there is room to be to begin discussions and connection and to figure out what are my boundaries? What are my needs? And how do I deal with this in a way that empowers my partner to not have to just change their behavior every second of the day so I don't have an emotion? Because that's Ooh. not helpful. Amen to that. Let's say that one more time. Not yeah. change, not have to have my partner change what they're doing because I have an emotion. Because we have emotions all the time. And what I'm hearing you say is that when when we have the awareness to look at jealousy for what you're speaking about, where jealousy is just communicating something. Yep. Jealousy is just a communication. So like oh, look, you really care about your partner and you're having this emotion about that. Right. So what are some, and when we, it's sound, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in that slow down and that awareness, then we can choose new actions that actually work inside and maybe inside of like the agreements as you were speaking about earlier. Yes. That, yeah. That yeah. you've so already made. It's a, it's a multi-step process to work with jealousy. One okay. is- I need to release myself from any shame that I have, that I have jealousy at all. Because in, in non-monogamy, we sort of have the opposite of with monogamy. In monogamy, jealousy is often seen as proof of love, right? And the right amount of jealousy is actually correct. There is like a right amount. In non-monogamy- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know that conversation, yep. Yes, like it's the right amount. Um, and But in non-monogamy, we have another problem, which is the myth of the good poly person, right? The good poly person doesn't feel any jealousy or they transform their jealousy into compersion. And that's BS because jealousy is not the raw material of compersion. Joy is. You don't transform jealousy into compersion. Jealousy and compersion can learn to sit next to each other. Awesome. 
But in order to do that, we do, we need to do exactly what you said, slow down, slow way down, and then develop a set of techniques that work for you in your unique body in your body that has your nervous system and has your history and your trauma and all of that, a set of ways that you can work for jealousy with jealousy, because the first thing that's going to happen is you notice a sensation in your body. And if the earlier you can notice your sensations of jealousy, and people usually describe it in my research as knots, tightness, constriction, stomach stuff, anxiety, and nervousness tends to be in the belly or lower, sometimes up into the throat, right? Mm -hmm. If you notice those sensations, very soon you can start to, oh, okay, wait, so that's jealousy. Okay. First off, I don't need to take an action right now. There is nothing you can do in that moment that will be better than what you can plan once your nervous system is calmed and your prefrontal cortex is online. So slow down, no bar fights needed. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, now you have the opportunity to look at the agreements that you have, look at, am I honoring my own boundaries? Do I have a good sense of holding my internal boundaries? Do I know what I need from my partner? Do I, have I asked? One of the most simple moves of jealousy remediation is asking for reassurance. And many people won't do it because they see it as a sign of weakness, especially people in cisgender male bodies. They see mm -hmm. it as a sign of weakness. So they don't ask. Reassurance is a reasonable ask. And if your partner tells you it's not, then it's time to really get into it. I want to work with a coach or a therapist or somebody who can say, is that because it's like every five seconds or is that because no mentions of jealousy are okay? Because there's a, there are a lot of ways this can be happening. Right. Lots of different ways that it shows up for sure. Ex exactly. Yeah. And in every single case, what you have is you've got more information about who you are in relationships and you potentially got information about how you were connected to your earliest caregiving experiences. The ones even before you were verbal, those are actually pretty hard to get information on. So when you have this jealousy intel, if you're doing some other maturing work and that so anything spiritual work therapy work whatever you're doing this is information to bring into that like oh I guess I do have some abandonment stuff or perhaps when I perceive interrupters oh where what is that connecting back to a lot of us experience sibling jealousy totally normal thing to experience have we actually reconciled it is it still going on in our family of origin, going home for Christmas? Are you still thrown back into a jealous mess? Or did your parents insist on everything being fair? And so everything has to be fair and you can't talk about jealousy at all. So many ways to work with this, but every right. single angle I have come at jealousy tells me there is material there that can help you not only relate to your partners better, but relate to yourself better. I thank you so much for breaking that down because that really is such a huge topic for people. And if people can just take that snippet of what you just said and listen to it like over and over again for a while, and then like you said, choose the path that you want for your own healing, right. spirituality, coaching, therapy, you know, whatever that might look like for you, but choose a path of healing, choose a path of you know, learning these tools to, to have that slow down and that awareness and right. that, and that really great gift of whatever that is for you. Right. right exactly. Yeah. And, and if you, if you are a person who's very low jealousy, I have, my anchor partner is extremely low jealousy. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. Then take this in and empathize, like let yourself be in the shoes of someone who is overwhelmed with it listen to this from that position and now see what you can do to not worry about changing your behavior. So somebody else doesn't feel that way, but to okay. allow yourself to really empathize with how slow this process might be and how much support they might need, not just from you, but from other resources as well to really learn about jealousy in a way that will be supportive of your relationship. Instead of just saying, "Ugh, he's just jealous. Ugh, <laughs> they're just jealous. So unhelpful. Right. Yeah. Okay. We are going to actually, we're going to skip over this next break because what I really want to, to come back around to um, was at the beginning when he started to get into, you know, the how, the how of people opening up their relationships. So now we've talked about some red flags. We've talked about jealousy, which is a really big topic. Um, but, you know, 
what are some healthy ways in which people can go about opening up their relationship? Okay. This is, this is a big deal because when it's done poorly, often people then assume that they can't open up, right? They, like they have a bad experience of trying to start the conversation and it's like hearing that, you know, record jack across and now nobody wants to do it. There are a bunch of things you can do that are helpful. Um, one is you can do a little level setting. You can simply start consuming some material that has examples of non-monogamy in it, some, some films, some shows and say, or you can use your, your, your friend, your wild friend, your wild friend, Jolie is non-monogamous. What do you think about that? And just sort of level set off, like what's their response? Just start to understand where your partner is at now. But then from there, I really like for people to remember that just because your partner has a negative reaction to it, or you aren't hearing their interest doesn't mean that you need to swallow this and never mention it because you're experiencing a real desire and swallowing real desire and never mentioning it does not, that is not actually your authentic self relating. No matter what your relationship agreement was, no matter what your marriage vows said, not talking about your, your desires will not help you actualize those vows. So I like for people to start the conversation by doing something like I have a quiz people can take to, to see like, where are you? Like, like, where are you? Are you ready to go? Good to go. Do you need foundations? Are you okay? But maybe not. I designed it out of my research and people can take that at joliequiz.com. But there's also have your partner listen to people like Elizabeth having these conversations and say, all I want to have is a conversation about the conversation. I, that's the beginning. The beginning is let's start talking about talking about it rather than let's start talking about Tinder. And right. the reason why we need to have this part of the conversation is because your partner just does not have the, the chance to all of a sudden have your experiences and everything you've thought of, which you may have been thinking about this since you were eight years old. If you're me, that's how long it was going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. They don't have that. So they need a chance to get up to date. And one of the things they're often missing, and this is the, the, um, the partner who's brought into the room often tells me, I just don't have the words. I don't have the vocabulary. Right. You got to give them some material that will help them get the vocabulary. So this is not you teaching them. So I actually have a, I have an audio conversation between me and my anchor partner that I send to people when I'm like, you have, give this to them. This is me saying you're, this is what your partner would say if they could. And from there, start a conversation because this is, that's your moment to begin talking about having the relationship of your dreams, whatever you want, whether that's about sex or not. Like, I want you to have the relationship you really want, all the yeah. relationships you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I could not agree more with anything that you just said. And, and I think that it does also go back to that idea of like, slowing down yeah. and going at a pace that works for everyone involved, even if that might be frustrating for the partner who wants to just be gung-ho and has been thinking about this since they were eight years old, right? Like, right. you know, but no one says that this is an easy journey. It's and, not. And you do have to, to pace it. But there's, and there's a beautiful balance point there because sometimes we go all the way over to that extreme or to, to an extreme where we're like, okay, we have to move at the pace of the slowest partner. True. And mm -hmm. if there's no intentionality around the process of opening up, then we miss the opportunity to support the partner that needs a slower pace right. to do this in ways that feel appropriately risky. So I like to use a graduated risk approach yeah. and to intentionally invite them into, okay, this isn't all or nothing. This is what's the next smallest step that you could take so that you are moving forward in your exploration, but you're not putting yourself into a trauma response. Totally, <laughs> it's, absolutely. It's, so it's both and, but a lot yeah. of people just want their partner to get on board faster. Yeah. And that's not the way it, it just doesn't work. Right. It just doesn't work. So, yeah. Well, and I, it, I think that we've, I think 
that this is kind of the, the best accumulation of this conversation because at the beginning we were talking about like, oh, the couple that like talks about it and talks about it and talks about it and talks about it. But then also the couple that like just dives straight, you know, head first over the cliff, right? And like, this is kind of like that happy medium where it's like, okay, I like the request is that this person slows down a little bit, but the request is that this person gets like that graduated risk, like you just said, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So we could talk about this forever. And unfortunately we have to start wrapping up. I'm like, oh no, I just want to keep talking, but I do have to respect the time of the show. Um, So I have a couple of questions to wrap up the show and then we're going to talk about what you're promoting and how people can get a hold of you so first question what does love mean to you it's everything i i agree with you elizabeth it it is everything like if i had to wear one t-shirt with one word on it for the rest of my life it would say love for me love is just a way that we talk about um being in this universe and being so lucky as to have consciousness. And that means it's going to be messy. And that's good news. <laughs> I love it. I, oh my, I do. I love that answer. You're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. If people get nothing else, what do you hope they got out of this episode? Hmm. Relationships um, can and should be built by and for the people in them. End of story. Mm, beautiful. What is one action that people can take out of listening today? Mm. If you're going to take one action, I want you to do actually exactly what Elizabeth said, turn toward yourself. If you don't know what opening up looks like for you or your partner has said that they want to, and they've put an episode like this in front of you, Turn inside rather than turning out and looking at what are they going to do? What, what, how can we do this? Turn inside and let yourself still long enough to realize that this really is that one wild and precious life thing. Like it really is trite and it is. So in fact, you get to make it whatever you want. And this opportunity that was put in front of you, whether you wanted it or not, it's here now. What are you going to do? Oh, beautiful. Okay. What are you promoting? So I would love, love, love actually for people to go to the quiz because the quiz, while the quiz is, I love this quiz because most, most quizzes about non-monogamy are like, they're more Buzzfeed style. And I made this one out of my research. Um, So I would love for people to just go to jolyquiz.com because once they do that, whether they're all in or not, or even if you're like, I am not actually interested, but my partner keeps saying it. After you take it, you'll get the invitation to talk to me. You'll get an invitation to learn how I work, but also like what the skills are I teach. I teach five pillars that you have to have in place before you open. You want those. <laughs> so the quiz is your entry into that information. And I really feel like people, anyone has the potential to open to the degree that's right for them if they get started with a solid foundation. And that's what I offer. Five Beautiful. pillars, even better than four. <laughs> Beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. And that, that link is in the show notes as well as all of the ways in which people can find you. And I would still love for you to answer the question. How can people find you? Sure. The easiest place to find me is on TikTok and Instagram. I am at Dr. Jolie underscore Hamilton, J O L I underscore Hamilton, like the musical. <laughs> Beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. And all of those links are in the show notes, uh, along with the quiz um, that Dr. Jolie was mentioning as well. And thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. I, this was fabulous. Thanks. Ah, ah, ah. Just like, ah, breath of fresh air. I love it. All right. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. Remember to 
like, subscribe, turn on the notifications, press whatever button is in front of you, give us a five-star review, let people know how awesome it is. And uh, if there is a notification button on wherever it is that you're listening, turn on the notification so you don't miss anything. We are live every Tuesday, 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page. And this is then aired on YouTube and podcast every Thursday. All links for that are also in the show notes. Just making it easy for everybody. Oh, I love and appreciate you all dearly. Thank you so much. And until next time, keep loving. You have been listening to The Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on transformationtalkradio.com, where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at elizabethannecunningham.com. That's elizabethannecunningham.com. 